Sure. Ah. Let me start that again. <laughs> All right. Welcome to uh, welcome to Evening Under the Stars, as hosted by George uh, Mason University Observatory. My name is Dr. Rob Parks, and I am the Deputy Director of the Observatory, as well as an Assistant Professor uh, teaching a variety of different courses uh, here at GMU. Um, our website is posted on the slide, as well as our Twitter and uh, GMU email. So if you have any comments or uh, questions about the, uh, these events, please, uh, please let us know. You can also go to the website and check out some of the previous talks that have been given uh, during our, our series, our lecture series, as well as see other, uh, other objects of interest that have been uh, shown to the public over the course of the, our, our different tours. Ordinarily, in the before times, before COVID was a thing, um, we would uh, we would be hosting you all in person, and we would be doing so on the top of Research Hall. And that, uh, in this picture, you see the uh, the observing control station right next to uh, our do uh, dome. Like I said, it's at the top of the uh, top of Research Hall here on campus. Here are a selection of different uh, different images that have been taken using our campus telescope. These are not fully up to date. Uh, one of our undergraduates, uh, Owen, has been doing tremendous work in terms of uh, doing astrophotography using our telescope. And because of the weather tonight and because it is, I believe, still actively raining, we will be using a closed dome tour, meaning that we will not actually open up the, the telescope to the sky and view the heavens as they currently are. However, I hope you stick around after the uh, after my talk uh, and allow us to show you the, the facility and allow you to show uh, show you some of the images that have been taken, specifically uh, specifically Owen's work, because it is, I highly recommend it. He is doing fantastic, uh, fantastic work with that. Our observatory, these public nights are held every, uh, every other Wednesday and they start at 7 p.m. all the way through this date is a, a bit. Uh, this date is a bit out of date. Uh, the next, uh, obviously, the next evening under the stars will be held in two weeks. Uh, speaker to be announced. The way that the uh, the tonight is going to function is that we will, uh, I will be giving a talk between thirty to forty five minutes, hopefully, uh, hopefully no longer than that, and then afterward we're going to have uh, guided tours of of the well virtually guided tours of our observatory and uh, its capabilities. If you would like to know the, the goings on at the, the university, particularly about the, the astronomy program and our uh, outreach arm, I uh, encourage you to go and subscribe to our newsletter, The Moon, uh, which is the Mason Observatory Outreach Newsletter. In it, we will uh, we talk about the department. We highlight uh, particular students who have been doing excellent work within our department. Uh, I write a small column uh, dealing with uh, space news, primarily uh, the ongoing space race, as it were, between um, of manned and unmanned missions, both into low Earth orbit and uh, also onto the moon and beyond to, to Mars and a uh, few further out into the. Uh, the solar system. So if you can, I highly recommend subscribing to that to learn more about the observatory. If you're even more interested in the observatory and would like to help us out financially, uh, you can. You can become a patron of the observatory. Um, all the proceeds that we use for the uh, from the patrons are used to upgrade our facilities and to help facilitate uh, public outreach events. One of the things that I'm most interested in doing here is expanding our reach to the um, to the Virginia public, the Northern Virginia public, and also uh, DC and Maryland, and bringing astronomy to um, those who do not have the access, for one reason or another, to visit an observatory or be able to have the unique experience of looking at the heavens or even looking at the sun through a telescope. We have a special telescope for that. Do not look at the sun uh, with a telescope unless it is properly protected, FYI. 
And so there are various levels that you can uh, contribute to us. Um, any level uh, is perfectly fine. And actually, uh, actually watching these, attending our, uh, attending our events and watching us either live or on YouTube does wonders for us in terms of uh, our ability to share with the public and uh, let the university know that we are uh, doing all that we can to share the beauty of astronomy with uh, the public. Like I said, the, uh, the personnel behind uh, Mason, there's myself, uh, the deputy director, there's the director, uh, Peter Plavchan, who is currently on paternity leave as he has been, um, he has been blessed with birth of two twin sons uh, recently. So he is at home taking care of uh, the pair of them. Uh, tonight we have uh, our two graduate assistants. Uh, we have Kevin and M. Um, this slide also needs to be updated. And uh, Jonathan S. Um, Jonathan is the president of the Friends of the Observatory, which is a student organization that will you know, that will utilize the telescope on uh, odd nights to do star parties, and also meets regularly to just uh, socialize and talk about whatever it is undergraduates talk about these days. So this is me. Um, I normally this would be where the, the we talk about the upcoming speaker. So I'm going to do that by talking about myself. Now this picture is a cautionary tale. Uh, I was on a cruise to to Cozumel, and this is taken on Cozumel, and this is me driving a scooter with a, with a cell phone taking a selfie. Don't suggest doing that. That was not the reason for my crash. And yes, a crash didn't happen. The reason for my crash was shortly after this photo was taken, um, the road went to the right and I didn't. And so around 45 kilometers per hour, I went into, uh, went off the road and boom, found myself in the, uh, uh, in the, the emergency room. Good times. But I was trying to look for the reason why I chose this picture because, you know, it's, it's kind of a funny story, at least when I think about it. And I was scrambling to find a headshot that was uh, that was appropriate, so I chose that one. Instead, um, as uh, when I am not crashing scooters on Mexican islands, I am, uh, as I said, I am a professor here at the observatory, looking to increase our uh, public outreach. My science background is primarily with young stars and stars with tremendously high magnetic fields. I am uh, very curious on how the uh, magnetic fields, very much like the, the magnets in, uh, on your refrigerator, what the, the, but much, much orders of magnitude larger. I am interested in how those magnetic fields evolve from the most babyest of stars to the stars uh, as they end their lives and become exotic objects like neutron stars, pulsars, and, and black holes. So I'm fascinated with how that, uh, how that um, moves about. The other thing I am fascinated about is the subject of this talk, which is the search for extraterrestrial life. Um, primarily, and when we talk about uh, extraterrestrial life, we're gonna talk about also uh, from microbial or what I consider to be not that exciting life to, you know, aliens. So uh, hopefully, you will, um, hopefully you will be as enthused as I am in, in talking about that. Okay, so, oh, uh, if there are any questions about uh, tonight's, if there are any questions about tonight's uh, event, uh, please put them in the chat and, and either Kevin M or I will uh, be happy to uh, answer those uh, questions as best we can. Well, really Kevin and M, because when I present, uh, I don't actually see the chat. So there's that. Okay. Ah. Pardon the interruption while I get my slides in order. So, oh. <clears throat> search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We have been interested in this, uh, this concept of 
life beyond our um, our own oasis of life for decades. And I don't need to tell any of you that our popular culture is rife with uh, with culture with references to extraterrestrials, um, all the way from movies like uh, Contact, which looks at a more scientific um, explanation or the TV, uh, TV series The Expanse, which is what we might consider hard science fiction that is grounded in reality, but also has elements of, or fantastical elements in terms of meeting and dealing with the first contact of human li or alien life, to more, shall we say, fantastical, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where we have giant purple aliens who attempt to eradicate half of half of all life in the galaxy. And so, as I've said, what we have is we have over this span, we have imagined extraterrestrial intelligence um, of coming in all varieties. We have the, the reclusive scientists who want to, uh, to study us, to experiment, potentially experiment on us, depending on who you talk to, all the way up to disgusting uh, just killing machines that want to eat all of this for some unknown reason. And speaking of reasons, we've also hypothesized as to why extraterrestrial intelligence would want to visit our planet from more nefarious uh, reasons for wanting to suck up all of our natural resources to getting lost and simply wanting to make a phone call. More recently, oops, more recently, and that slide is messed up. More recently, all right, uh, that's not gonna cooperate, but more recently we have had uh, instances where there are stellar objects or stars that we've observed that are just peculiar. They are unique, or at the moment they are unique, in that they display characteristics which are, well, unique. The first one you may have actually heard of, Tabby star or Boyajan star, as I like to call it, is a star with, with um, which bright or which dims irregularly, both in time and in depth, or the amount that it dims. And we've tried, we've thrown all manner of scientific explanations as to why the star behaves the way that it does. Why does the uh, star change so erratically in its brightness? And as I'll uh, show you in a moment, one of the uh, one of the explanations for this is megastructures. This idea of a Dyson sphere being being built around it, and the idea is that a Dyson sphere is currently under construction around Voyage and Star, and the reason why we're seeing the um, these light dips is because essentially struts, uh, mechanical or struts and panels are getting in the way and blocking out some of the light uh, as it goes around. Now the other star that you can't see is Bavinsky's star. Bovlinsky star, which I know I am not pronouncing correctly, is a peculiar star in that it has a peculiar uh, chemical, um, chemical signature. Now, we know that most of the, when the Big Bang happened, we had hydrogen, we had helium, we had a little bit of lithium. Everything else around us is stardust. Everything else around us was created uh, inside the interior of a star or during the explosive uh, event or the explosive death of high mass stars. Everything that we see beyond hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of the current lithium is was created by stars. And so we have a fairly good understanding of when we look at a, when we look at a star, what that chemical makeup should be based on its age and based on when it was formed because of this process of heavy element formation. Well, as it turns out, Blinsky's star has something in its uh, exterior, which is, well, again, unique as far as we know. There is an overabundance of uranium, exce an exceedingly heavy element, which ordinarily we would not have expected um, in such abundances in a star that has yet to go supernova. And so the, the, the idea here is, again, we've thrown as uh, a number of scientific explanations onto this to find out maybe it's eaten some planets that were uh, high in uranium for whatever reason. Um, who uh, We don't really know. But um, while we won't say that it's aliens, some people have actually claimed 
Well, it's aliens. As I said, um, around Boyajian Star, we believe that a, an alien megastructure, this was first proposed by Freeman Dyson back in the 60s. And the idea is you cannibalize all of the material inside or all of the material of the uh, of a solar system to build this structure which surrounds the star because the sun or the, the post star is the best source of renewable energy it is by far the most abundant energy source within a solar system so if you can capture all of that energy by surrounding it by some kind of receptacle then your energy needs are done you're, you're golden um, you have you won't have to uh, worry about resource uh, management really at all because your energy needs are well beyond taken care of. But the um, but there are certain signatures that one would expect with these structures, like these things are going to be exceedingly hot. And so, in the infrared part of the spectrum, we would detect uh, the aura of the uh, of these structures, even if they're being built. And unfortunately, we really don't see that with Voyage and Star. So the idea of a Dyson sphere being built around that star, they are probably, those claims are probably, don't have strong evidence to support them. But again, we don't really know, so we can't rule out everything entirely. The first love affair of, of aliens or little green men probably began Around 17, uh, 1877, by an Italian astronomer by the name of Giovanni Ciparelli. Ciparelli, this is a map of Mars as drawn by Ciparelli using an eyepiece. So this is prior to uh, photographic plates. This is certainly prior to digital cameras. And so maps such as these were created simply by eye. And he, when he drew this, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, as you can see, he thought that, that you know, he believed that he was seeing uh, canali or channels. But unfortunately, when his, when his paper was, uh, was translated from Italian to English, canali was translated as channels or canals rather, not channels. Because Ciparelli more than likely believed to be, uh, these to be geologic in nature. He believed that these were probably just uh, riverbeds or maybe, or it's unknown whether he thought they were riverbeds filled with water or they were just dry riverbeds, but more than likely he believed them to be of geologic nature because in his paper, he by no means discusses uh, extraterrestrials in any, in any way. And as it happens, we have done, we've now photographed Mars extensively. We do not find these can, uh, canals really in any way whatsoever, at least not in the way that um, he is seeing them. So more than likely, he was stretching the abilities of his telescope to see fine detail, and these were more than likely an optical illusion. But that didn't stop Percival Lowell. Percival Lowell was an um, a independently wealthy individual, a businessman, uh, from my understanding. And in 1894, he built, with his own money, um, observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. So if you, um, a word of perspective, as it were, I know that a lot of people have been dismissing the, the current uh, space, uh, space tourism race as just billionaires throwing around money. But as it happens with astronomers or with astronomy, a lot of the early astronomy, particularly a lot of the early innovations in astronomy were done by independently wealthy uh, individuals who uh, wanted to explore the universe. So who knows what will happen with uh, what Branson's work and with uh, Bezos's work, where, uh, where that will ultimately lead us. Uh, hopefully it will lead us to a much more economical space travel uh, than we currently have. But anyway, enough of my tangent. Uh, Percival Lowell, uh, like I said, in 1894, built the Flagstaff Observatory. One of the reasons why he built it was because of that Schiaparelli paper. He wanted, he was so intrigued with the idea that they were canals, man-made or Martian-made, uh, excuse me, Martian-made um, channels of water on the planet that he wanted to find these Martians. He wanted to be able to observe them in some definitive way. And he thought he had, 
uh, Lowell believed that he actually not only saw these canals, but he saw them change over time and such that uh, during the summer months, the canals were, so Mars has icy poles and um, Mars go, undergoes seasons just like the earth does, but in a more exaggerated way. And so the, in the sense that the poles uh, significantly melt during the, uh, the northern pole significantly melts during the um, during the northern summer and vice versa. And so what he believed that he saw was during the summer months, the number of canals actually doubled. As you can see from one, uh, one image to the next, um, the left-hand side is an image of, or drawing of, of Mars, I should say, uh, in the winter. And the one on the right is the one in, in summer the canals actually multiply. Well, as the story goes, one of his assistants or graduate students came to him and said, uh, Mr. Lowell, according to your drawing and the scale of your drawing, the tele resolution of the telescope didn't, isn't, it's not possible for you to be able to see that. Uh, that assistant no longer worked there after a while, which proves the old adage, the boss may be wrong, but the boss is still the boss. So, but the idea still holds that when we look at, uh, when we look at Percival's observations, we really, um, we can't take them too seriously because again, he is claiming to be able to see things his telescope physically cannot do. Um, he also claimed to be able to see oases or basically places where uh, there would be cities located where there was abundance of, of water due to these canals. Now the real search for intelligent life and the, the idea, and I'll talk a little bit more about this momentarily, but um, the idea of intelligent life had been around for seriously within the astronomical community, had been seriously discussed for about, uh, since the 1950s. And in 1972, with the help of Frank, uh, Frank Drake, uh, we placed a plate on uh, Pioneer 11, one of the first deep space pro probes and this plate contained two images of the um, two images of human beings, one male, one female. Um, it had a silhouette of the satellite and an antenna that could be used as a form of reference when looking at the relative size of our solar system uh, in terms of the size of the planets, not the distance. It also showed uh, this uh, in the upper left, you can see a representation of a hydrogen atom, and not to get too far into the weeds, but there is a particular there is a particular um, wavelength of light which emanates throughout the universe, which is the essentially the most common type of emission that um, that occurs because, for one thing, it occurs from neutral hydrogen, and for the other, neutral hydrogen is one of the most abundant things in the universe. And so this particular, um, particular wavelength is uh, formed when the hydrogen atom flips. And so it is believed the logic behind this is that uh, aliens would also know that this is the most common, uh, common, common wavelength that they could see and the reason for why. So this was basically telling them if the spacecraft itself wasn't uh, obvious enough, this is telling uh, the aliens that we are in fact intelligent, that we have an understanding or at least a rudimentary understanding of space and science. Frank, uh, Frank Drake took it up, also took it upon himself to start beaming out uh, messages. So Pioneer was just a, a Pioneer had a science mission in and upon itself to, uh, to go out and study. And so that, that plaque was just simply an add-on. Uh, about a couple of years later, he decided, well, let us start signaling to aliens that if there are any alien spacecraft out there so whizzing around, let's send them a signal and again, show them a pictograph of various things from the atomic structure of carbon to uh, the double helix of, of, of DNA to a silhouette of the man and a radio telescope basically showing that there, there is intelligent life, that these are coherent uh, ideas that are being communicated through radio waves. And so he chose a particularly large cluster of SARS. He aimed, he aimed Arecibo, which was 
the largest radio telescope in the world for its collapse uh, fairly recently. Um, he aimed Arecibo at this particular cluster and he just started beaming, um, beaming radio signals towards that in the hope that over the course of hundreds of thousands of years, an alien civilization might pick it up and look in our direction. I think it's a long shot and it's gonna take a while for that long shot to pay off, but eh, who knows? If you got it, you might as well use it. Now I'm gonna to try to uh, play this. I'm gonna to try to play one of them because I, I particularly like the, the sound of it. We actually sent out a gold plated record uh, on Voyager in 1970, uh, 1977. If any, all those Star Trek, if there are any Star Trek fans out there, this is the uh, this is V'ger. This is the uh, main bad guy from uh, uh, from Star, uh, Star Trek: The Motion Picture. We sent a gold plated record, which again had pictographs of of various things on the Earth, but it also could be played. It literally could be played on on a, a record player. And there are a number of sounds, and you can Google it. You can Google record uh, record sounds of Voyager, and you can find a database of this. I'm going to see if I can actually play one. Nope, I can't. The reason why I, I like this one is um, it is the sound of a mother kissing a child and the child crying. Now, for whatever reason, um, we wanted aliens to hear a baby cry. Okay, sure. I, I would have really liked to have been in the room for that discussion. So should we have a, send out a conversation, send out a, a, a conversation between two people? No, that's, that's, too, that's too much. I know, baby crying. Everyone loves to hear a baby cry. That's what we should uh, subject to the alien civilization, intelligent alien life or civilization too. Now, going back to uh, Ciparelli, going back to um, this idea of life on Mars, we actually took that fairly seriously because, um, because Mars is similar enough to Earth that it's provocative to believe that life could have existed on its surface. And there is still uh, open questions as to whether or not life did exist on Mars billions of years ago, but because Mars is significantly smaller than the Earth, it lost its, uh, its substantial atmosphere billions of years ago. And so there was nothing to protect the surface from, uh, there was nothing to keep any kind of water from boiling off. There was nothing to keep the, the oxygen, any kind of oxygen trapped onto, uh, in the atmosphere itself or onto the surface. And there certainly wasn't any kind of shielding to protect folks from, gamma rays, x-rays, and uh, other harmful rays such as that. But could there be life anyway? Could there be microbial life buried just under the surface? Now, one of the reasons why we, um, why we think that this is a high probability, and one of the reasons why we think it's a fairly good, pro a fairly good bet that there was at least liquid water on the surface of Mars is that there are many or numerous examples of fe geologic features that really can only be explained by running water. And so you can see here snaking across the image is what looks suspiciously like a riverbed, which, uh, which if true would illustrate that there was in fact liquid water on the, uh, on the surface, not only in liquid state, but in running liquid state, that it was truly melted and it would truly uh, ran from one location to the other, carrying sediment along the way. You also have images such as this, where uh, from the Spirit Rover, you have what looks to be potentially a Northern Ocean feeding a, uh, feeding a river, which then flees down into a uh, plain, which contains a lake. And we, the, the coloration is, uh, due to the chemical elements that we see within those um, within those particular terrains, so the rocky terrain, we see different elements than we do in those flatlands uh, that we believe water uh, could exist. And from um, and we also see geologic features from the Spirit and Opportunity rovers that again have um, that are reminiscent of geologic features on the Earth caused by water action. 
then finally we get to uh, Viking. Well, not finally. We we get to dressing Viking one and two. These are probes which are landed on the uh, surface of Mars. That one of their primary job, well, not primary, but one of their main jobs, they had three experiments to test whether or not there was, in fact, life in a microbial form, in single cell uh, or simple multicellular life on the surface of, of Venus. And as it turns out, one of the tests was positive. The other two were negative. But because of, the, because of the nature of the test and because of the nature of the fact that the other two were conclusively negative, the um, scientists at the current moment believe that the positive claim or the positive result was due to some kind of contamination of the spacecraft, which is one of the reasons why when you, when you, if you ever see images of people creating the, the rovers or creating satellites, you see them in these getups where they look like they're handling radioactivity. The reason why they were in, that, uh, in those suits is to prevent any kind of contamination or uh, or basically lint or material from getting on the sensitive pieces of equipment that they have to, uh, that they are building and assembling in these satellites. Today we have uh, the Curiosity rover has uh, been sent in 20, uh, 2012. I do apologize, this talk is a little dated. It, I don't really uh, have anything on perseverance or ingenuity, but it shows that we are still invested in answering that question of whether or not there is in fact life on Mars. Uh, right now, um, we're, the question still hasn't been answered even with Viking because those are essentially two data points on an immense planet. So just because Viking well, didn't, find, didn't find life could have meant that it you know, landed on the equivalent of the Sahara Desert uh, on Mars. It doesn't mean that there are not other locations more interesting and harder to get to locations that will, uh, that will actually lead us to the, a positive result. Other places on uh, other places in the universe, well, excuse me, other places in the solar system where life could exist are icy moons, particularly the moons of Europa and, and uh, Enceladus. Um, so, and Ganymede and Callisto. And the idea uh, here is these moons are close enough to their planets that they are tidally locked and they're constantly undergoing stresses by Jupiter or Saturn. And so you can think of it as a, uh, as a stress ball. Jupiter and Saturn are constantly squeezing and releasing these, uh, these, uh, these planets or these moons, and that creates a lot of internal energy. And because of that, while the upper crust of the, of the up, uh, while the upper surface of these moons is an icy crust, analogous to our rocky crust, whereas we have a molten lava mantle surrounding our core, these worlds have an ocean, a salty ocean, or at least we believe there is a salty ocean underneath this crust surrounding their uh, rocky cores. And if you have water and if you have energy, the energy coming from tidal, uh, tidal heating, those are the two things you need for life. What's even more provocative and unfortunately, I don't have time to really show this video, but what's more provocative is that with Enceladus, Enceladus has shot out geys or geysers of ice and uh, water and uh, material, water vapor out into uh, space. Essentially, these are cryovolcanoes, where instead of magma being blown out, into, um, blown out over to the surface of Europa, you have water ice being blown out and because the surface gravity on Europa is so small, or excuse me, on Enceladus is so small, these materials actually get blown out into space. And it just so happened that one of these went off when the Cassini probe flew by. And what's, what's really cool is it was able to uh, figure out what the chemical composition of that geyser was. And there are six, uh, six elements that we need or that we believe are necessary for the formation of life and it detected five of them. So we have an energy source, 
we have water so that the material can freely move around, get to know each other, mingle, you know, do a thing, form life. We also have the components, at least five of six components to uh, create to great life. I believe the one that we ha they haven't found is potassium, but I could be very wrong about that. The other sort of provocative world is Titan. Titan is provocative in that it's a sort of bizarro Earth. It is, one, it is the largest moon of, of Saturn, and it's bizarro in that it's the only uh, other body, well, excuse me, it is the only moon that has an, a substantial atmosphere. It also has geologic features, which are reminiscent of geologic features here on Earth, mountains, plains, and even oceans. The problem is what all of this is made out of. The, uh, and that's primarily ammonia, ethane, methane, and hydrocarbons. So while there are oceans, there are oceans of methane. While there is an atmosphere, it's primarily ethane and ammonia gas. So it stinks there. It really, really smells bad on Titan. Um, but the idea is potentially if you could there are hydrocarbons, which means there is carbon and uh, potentially water could form, although we haven't really detected it on uh, Titan. You know, there are, there is a liquid substrate by which these building blocks of life could form. It's not water, which is the best at it. It is meth liquid methane, but that is not to say that life could not find a way and actually uh, form on Titan. Who knows? When talking about life elsewhere, particularly the development of, of higher order species or uh, larger multicellular, more complex uh, life, what we have to uh, do is we have to start developing criteria to see whether or not these worlds are in fact habitable. Now, there are, a, there are, innumerable, uh, there are numerous factors that go into what makes the earth, for example, an oasis of life. There is its, its temperature, its size, the fact that we have a large moon, the fact that we have access to a certain special mixture of, of elements, that water somehow found its way on, onto the surface. There are many, many different factors which go into, we have a relatively boring star that we orbit around. All these factors uh, come into the habitability equation as it were. But we have to start somewhere. We have to have some foundation onto which we can build uh, a more complete framework. And that first stepping stone or first foundation stone that we have laid is something known as the habitable zone. Now the habitable zone is strictly or is loosely defined as where water can exist in a liquid state around, on a planet or moon surrounding a star. So as you can see here, you have uh, really low mass, very faint stars have habitable zones that are very, very close to the, uh, their host star and they're very, very narrow. But as you go upwards, the habitable zone is the green portion uh, that you see on the graph. As the stars get hotter and larger, the habitable zone gets wider and it gets further out. And you can see that the earth is pretty well situated within that habitable zone. We are, we are comfortably situated where that even if we moved a little bit inward or a little bit outward, uh, at least water would be okay. Complex organisms like ourselves, that's a different question entirely. But water would be fine. So when we, uh, when, when we start looking for exoplanets, when we start looking for potential uh, places for life, excuse me, the, my chair is really squeaky. Uh, if you, when we start looking for uh, extra place or places where life could exist, we first look at places that are that are in within the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone, um, because we need at least this foundation stone before we can even look at other factors, such as whether or not the star is appropriate, appropriately boring, whether or not there might be water within the system, so forth and so on. When we do find these planets within the solar or within these habitable zones, and we have found exoplanets in the right locations or in the in locations where water could exist, the next step is to see whether or not water is actually there. And so this gives you an, an idea of some of the 
the body is that we can uh, appropriately measure these things. This is this requires very high precision measurements. And so far, really, we can only do that. We can do this kind of for certain closer exoplanets, but we can't really do this on a wide scale yet. Hopefully satellites like uh, the James Webb Telescope will get renamed and eventually launch, and it will, in fact, be able to provide measurements of the atmospheres of exoplanets so that we can look for signatures like water and oxygen, which you can see here. Just, um, just take my word for it that, the, that those wiggly lines, they are uh, examples of, of light being emitted from water vapor and from uh, hydrocarbons and from oxygen. And so that blue, uh, so the green line uh, near the bottom, that's what our atmosphere would look like if observed from far away. The blue line would be a super earth or an earth which is say a few times more massive than the earth. Uh, the pink or the light blue line is a warm sort of mini Neptune, which might be a water world like uh, Europa. And then you have Venus, which doesn't really have much in the way of, uh, of these elements at all. And you also have the Ar uh, Archean Earth, which was the Earth just our, after it solidified and formed. So, as I said, the the idea of extraterrestrial life has been around, or serious talk about the existence of extraterrestrial life has been around since the 50s. And during a set of observations that was being done at Green Bank Telescope, or Green, uh, Green Bank Radio Telescope, which is a radio observatory in West Virginia, a number of fairly um, now fairly famous scientists were literally sitting around a, a lunch table and were debating this. And the product of that lunchtime, and I would really love to have a seat at that lunch table. It, the, you know, those, those questions of where would you uh, time travel to? That's high on my list is to sit at that table and listen to Enrico Fermi formulate the early beginnings of what is now known as the Fermi paradox which states that if life is in any way common or just rare, if, it is, if there is any small chance that life is a ubiquitous feature of stellar or planetary formation, the question is, where is it? Where are these aliens? Um, you know, if you don't count the recent uh, UFO sightings that uh, the government has put out, we really have no evidence to suggest that this planet has been visited by extraterrestrial life. We have no evidence of radio signals or um, optical detections like Boyajian star and Pravinsky star are tantalizing, but again, they're not conclusive in any way. So where is everybody? And hopefully I can, uh, I can illustrate to you that this is a serious question. Because life on, on the, the probability of life on uh, other planets, even if rare, even if very rare, would still, and these, and these species had any inclination of exploring the universe like we certainly do, then they could actually do it fairly, e well, they could do it easily on a fairly low, uh, short astronomical time scale. Uh, very long to us. We're talking tens of millions of years. But it's certainly a blink of an eye in terms of the fact that the Milky Way galaxy has been around for um, roughly 10 billion years or so. So it's just a fraction of the amount of time. So the Fermi paradox states that, or it sets up, if that given that planets are common, life is easy to evolve, intelligence is only a matter of time, that all that primarily things evolve to intelligence, then given the vastness of the universe, um, both in space and in time, we would expect many civilizations. That's uh, basically what it, uh, Fermi was talking about. But as, like I said, as I'll hopefully be able to show you, uh, time permitting, even if life is rare, we have the question of why, um, why aren't we seeing them? 
And so uh, Frank Drake, uh, who came around onto the scene uh, about a decade later, uh, did some uh, early work and he formulated something known as the Drake equation, which states the probability or it states the, excuse me, it states the, the number of civilizations you would expect given these various factors. The first one is the number is the rate of star formation. The next one is the fraction of planets that form planetary systems. Uh, the next one is the fraction of planets or the number of planets that um, number of Earths that form from those. The fraction of those Earths with ta which have uh, suitable planets or I'm sorry, number of planets with suitable at or sort of suitable environments, the fraction of suitable planets that have environments where life could actually arise, the fraction of planets of those that have uh, intelligent life upon them, the the fraction of intelligent life turning into sophisticated civilizations, and then finally the time scale of how long civilizations last before they are destroyed by some for some reason, uh, either self-destruction or their stars explode or what have you. For some reason, uh, they, they end. So in 1961, um, uh, Drake hypothesis or basically put out certain ranges for, um, for these values to come up with essentially a bottom end and a top end to the number of intelligent civilizations out there. Out there. And as you can see, that number varies wildly. Uh, basically, given his, uh, given his fractions, uh, particularly in the lifetime of, of communication, we can have as little as 20 civilizations within the span of the uh, within the span of galactic age, or 50 million uh, civilizations. So not really narrowing it down too much. But unfortunately, from a modern perspective, we really can't narrow it down either. Because while we can, while we know the uh, the stellar formation rate far more accurately than uh, Drake did, and Drake was actually underestimating it, we now know that the galaxy produces about five to seven stars per year. We also now know, and again, uh, Drake was underestimating this, that planets are a ubiquitous uh, a ubiquitous feature. That if you form a star, you're almost almost guaranteed to form planets around those stars. And we're also getting the point, and this is where uh, Drake overestimated, we're also getting the point, we have enough exoplanets out there that we can statistically state that around 40% of planets are, oh, excuse me, um, point, uh, there are 0.4% uh, of, uh, pl of, of planets are going to be Earth-like. With a fraction of the fraction of stars with, or yeah, I'm losing my ability to speak. The fraction of planets with life, we've narrowed it down to Drake was very optimistic. Now we've come to a sort of binary, uh, um, binary point of view. Life is either really, 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 really rare, or it's it all always happens. Scientists have come to consensus, it's either one or the other. There is no middle ground. Considering the complexity of creating life, either that of those circumstances happen very, very rarely, or they always happen. As for the other ones, the fraction with uh, intelligent life, the fractions with intelligent civilizations, we basically have to default to the, the Drake's Drake's values because we don't, we just don't know. We don't have any evidence at any at all about those values. So we just take um, Drake's numbers and we get something pretty close to what he got. We're, the upper limit or the bottom limit is a little bit higher. The upper limit's a little bit higher. Uh, we get around 300 to 56 million. So it depends on how optimistic or pessimistic you want to be in terms of whether or not life uh, exists in the universe. So 
I will quickly run through this. The idea is, um, and actually I will highlight um, von Neumann machines to give you an idea of where are these things. Because this is technology that is in its infancy for us. So it doesn't take, relatively speaking, a tremendously, it doesn't take like um, Starfleet in order to expand the or explore the universe. It just takes 3D printers and a sophisticated, uh, sophisticated enough AI. So von Neumann uh, came up with this concept of self-replicating machines. So machines that had 3D printers and had the intelligence to be able to identify where there were natural resources on the planet that they uh, that the initial probe lands, be able to send out little tiny probes to collect that material and then just start building up from there and being able to build a space, basically a spaceport using robot technology. And again, we're now we're just now getting to the point where we, we have 3D printers, we're getting to the point we have AI that's sophisticated, uh, that is fairly sophisticated. Some might, um, some might warn that it's actually too sophisticated, but that's a subject for another talk. So again, this is something we can do now. If you are traveling at 10% the speed of light, which we have uh, satellites that we can accelerate to that, uh, to that rate, and we assume that the average distance, the average distance between stars is something like five light years. Now, here is probably the, the assumption that is the weakest of all of these, is that um, it might be that the average distance is actually a little bit bigger than that, but not too much bigger. So what that means is that it takes 50 years for a, uh, for a probe to go from one planet to another assuming that they survive. We also assume that it's gonna take 150 years for the probe once it lands to actually, you know, develop enough or grant, give enough uh, material and um, get enough material and then reproduce itself so that it launches a probe to the next, uh, to the next world and repeats itself. If you repeat that enough, if you have basically um, uh, well, if you, if you repeat that enough, in about 10, billion, uh, 10 million years, you can actually colonize every single planet in the galaxy, as far as we know, in terms of the number of planets to be expected in, gal in the galaxy. Um, I thought I had another slide on that. There are other, um, now there's the question of how many of these probes actually survive? Well, it turns out if you take a very pessimistic viewpoint on this, you go from uh, a few tens of millions of years to about a billion years. That's still plenty of time for, uh, or no, about a billion years. That's still plenty of time for the universe, to, or for the galaxy rather, to be populated using this particular method. Now, what are the answers to the Fermi paradox? Well, or why, or I should say, what are the reasons for it? Why would they want to colonize? They would pretty much have to have a psychology very close to, the, uh, huma uh, to humanity, which is debatable in and upon itself. And if you assume that their psychology is similar to, the, to, the, uh, to humanity in terms of curiosity and uh, predilections towards warfare, then you pretty much get to the age old reasons. Um, aliens might be escaping war, they may be escaping persecution, they may be trying to find uh, resources which other parts of their civilization are hoarding. Uh, so there are a very, there are a few different reasons for why uh, galactic colonization would occur. Um, ah, here's a tale. So in two, actually two million years, we would expect given very pessimistic, uh, pessimistic, view, uh, pessimistic survival rates for these von Neumann machines that we would colonize trillions of planets. So again, where is everybody? There are a few, a few possible solutions. We are truly alone. The reason for that is 
uh, one, uh, Adam Frank believes that the, the true choke point is climate change. Is it depends on how a civilization deals with climate change that they are going to, in fact, survive long enough to potentially colonize or die off as a species. Um, he really drives home the point of, of cl how climate change as a cataclysmic event. It could be that we are the first, or it you know, could be that there is no galactic civilization, that there are, in fact, there are. Um, species out there there are intelligent life uh, out there but they're it's scattered it's very few and they don't colonize for whatever reason they could be xenophobic or they could as um as indicated by my background they could have some kind of prime directive they could um look at our species and be like nope um we are not touching that right now um so um and so they could have like i said some Prime directive. With that, I think I am. I just want to highlight a couple of. Actually, I want to highlight this, which is SETI at home. And this is right now. SETI at home is um, is offline, but it will be coming back online when data from uh, Green Bank and data from uh, the New Allen Telescope Array comes online. And this is something you can download from that website. What they're going to be doing is they're going to be essentially scanning the entire sky, looking for coherent signals. Now we get radio signals on all over the sky, but they're noisy. Essentially they're not coherent or we can identify them, we can identify them as uh, astrophysical objects. So what this does is it takes all that data or all of that data, what they're trying to do is they're trying to find signals that are regular and repeating that are not from astrophysical, like known astrophysical sources. But the thing is, that is a tremendous amount of data. And so what they're looking for is they're looking for citizen scientists like you or I to help them with this. So if you download their software, you can download packets of, those, of that captured data and you can use your own computer to crunch those numbers and then send it back to them. And who knows, your computer may be the one that actually finds ET trying to phone home from whatever planet he got stuck on next. So with that, I think that I will, uh, I will end and turn it over to, um, to answer any questions that you might have and then turn it over to Em and Kevin to uh, host the tour. So uh, thank you for your attention. I hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Hey, Dr. Parks. Hey, uh, Peter. Let's, let's give our speaker a round of applause, our very own Dr. Parks. Uh, you can uh, use a virtual reaction and uh, I guess the hand claps. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it was great to hear that talk. I was able to catch uh, about half of the audio while I was in between parenting responsibilities. Uh, but uh, I did just hear from um, Kevin that uh, his internet connection is down due to the weather. Uh, tonight, so it's uh, I jumped in to help with uh, M and uh, yourself with the rest of tonight. So I'd like to open the floor to some questions uh, for Dr. Parks and, and moderate that. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Right now, we've got a small enough group. I think we could do that um, or uh, paste any questions you have in the chat. And then what we're going to do after the Q&A is we're going to, um, you could also raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question with the reactions. Um, and so after the Q&A, we're going to go ahead and do a closed dome tour. Um, I don't know if it's actually raining at this very second. Let me go take a look at the radar map, but it's been very wet out uh, with some thunderstorms over the past few hours. I don't know if for those of you in the audience, whether you're local or not. Uh, but and there's my seven-year-old uh, who's still not asleep, but yeah, it's still raining currently. So we're not going to be opening the dome tonight. So we are going to have a brief, what we call a closed dome tour, where we show you the telescope and show you some of its capabilities and look at some of the images uh, that we've collected. In fact, some of our students right now over on Discord are posting some beautiful color composite images of data that they've collected. Really kind of like, I think they're blowing my mind with some of the images they're, they're collecting. So do we have any questions?
So I'll, I'll go ahead and ask one of Dr. Parks while we're uh, waiting. Um, we did hear an interesting talk today, uh, kind of related to the Fermi paradox. Um, and it, it was uh, from Dr. Caitlin Rasmussen, and she's leading this study called the um, Seamstress study, which is looking for planets around metal poor stars. So as you know, and, and maybe the rest of the audience doesn't know, metal poor stars tend to be older stars for when our universe was younger, when our galaxy was brand new. And I, I've never really thought about it, but can you comment on um, the implications of planet formation and how that may affect the Fermi paradox? Let's say, for example, if planets didn't form for a few billion years, is, is it maybe that uh, yeah. Well, um, one of the one of the sort of solutions to the Fermi paradox, which this would either uh, would contribute or not, uh, I think it would actually contribute, is that the idea that life life may be um, may be ubiquitous. It may be that life is very common in its formation, but it also may be that it takes a very long time for it to come about. If you look at the Earth, for example, it took close to 4 billion years for us to be around. So it might be that it takes a very long time for planets to, or for planets to host life, assuming that it's common enough that life could exist. So if you have planets around metal poor stars, where the, these stars are close to the age of the universe, like 10 billion years or, or slightly longer, then that would indicate that what we need to be doing is we need to be looking at the globular clusters in our galaxy and maybe those clusters are actually pockets of galactic civilization now i um i tend to be a little bit more pessimistic in my viewpoint in that uh from my understanding uh we're with our with our planetary surveys we're not seeing planets around uh, metal poor stars now that could be a selection effect in that we're not looking for them around metal poor stars, but they're metal poor, which means the building blocks of planets are gonna be, there's gonna be less building blocks to start off with. So who knows whether or not they're going to be, um, basically there may be planets, but they may not have the building blocks necessary for life to exist, which is my long-winded answer. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, if, if indeed, you know, planets, number one, require heavy elements to make in the first place, that automatically sets the time scale for life back by, you know, two to four billion years, because you have to wait a few generations of stars. Uh, and then, then I guess there's the question of how much does life rely on heavy elements? I mean, we all know that life is carbon based, right? Um, but uh, it, it takes a while to build up the heavy elements too. You need a few rounds of supernova explosion. So I think it's a really interesting question to ponder as a possible solution to the Fermi paradox. Mm, sure. um, and there was actually a, a, I have an email sitting in my inbox from actually a colleague of ours here at Mason in the economics department. Uh, and they've uh, published a paper in the astrophysical journal on this as the solution to the Fermi paradox, saying that we we don't see life everywhere just because humans are early. Yes, that was one of the one of the ideas that I hadn't quite um, I kind of ran out of time for is that one solution is that we are the first or one of the 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 first civilizations to to exist because of the fact wild. that it takes billion years to billions of years for us for life to develop. Yeah, yeah, that would be, that would be, yeah, that would be mind blowing if that were actually the case. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, now, it, in comparison, though, for um, microbial or primordial life, Dr. Summers was commenting earlier today that, you know, I mean, we pretty much found evidence for life on Earth as soon as it was even remotely habitable in some locations. And so maybe we may be the first intelligent civilization, don't know, but um, maybe when we look for more um, advanced life, 
uh, we won't find it, but when we look for primordial life, maybe we will find that. And that will be very, maybe that's a question we might be able to answer in our lifetimes with these upcoming mass emissions. If we do find evidence for basic life, but not evidence for advanced life, maybe that would be a consistent story um, with uh, humans being early. Yeah, I think that would definitely, when it came to the, um, the Drake equation, that would certainly narrow down uh, how, how easy it is to, to form life. Uh, to answer that particular coefficient. Excuse me, my cat is trying to eat one of my Legos. Your cat is welcome to join us for the record. Oh, all right. um, it's much better than murder hornets. He's like, no. For those of you that were with us, was it two, no, four weeks ago? We uh, we had a we had an unwelcome visitor for our first in person in person uh, evening under the stars. Dr. Parks, at the beginning today, did you go over um, the fact that we're only virtual for the rest of the semester? Oh, I didn't actually. I, I okay. uh, forgot to forgot that. Yeah. So for those of you that um, uh, have joined us tonight, we are only offering a virtual evening under the stars for the rest of the semester due to the Delta variant, uh, and. Um, uh, sorry if you didn't get the chance to uh, see the telescope in person, but if you'd like to, we could still do some individual tours um, and just feel free to reach us out, out to us on Twitter or via our email address, gmeobservatory at gmail.com. Speaking of the chat, I'll put the email address in our, our email address in the chat and we can add the website there too later. Uh, we had a comment from Nanor, and apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. I think there is one above me, and I don't know the context there, but maybe you were referring to someone wanting to ask a question. There's a there was a question about uh, a class project for me, and I'm currently uh, ah okay yeah okay. Um, so, any other questions for Dr. Parks? Well, thank you for that wonderful talk. SETI has been really of interest to our department recently. Uh, and uh, I, you know, it, the Drake equation, everyone always comes back to it. And I, uh, it's interesting because it doesn't take into account things like this whole metallicity question, right? You know, maybe stars don't form right away. It's talking about the current star formation rate. Mm. And uh, so, True. so, so if this early human, if humans are early in the universe, if we're the early intelligent civilization in our galaxy anyway. It raises an interesting question about some of these SETI searches that are looking for essentially techno signature archaeology. Right? There are some groups that have realized that uh, when you look for primordial life, that primordial life won't have left its planet. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for intelligent life, there's, you know, and you assume they're more advanced for us than us, and they've actually left their star system. There may be evidence of past intelligent life on multiple planets. So let's say if you have a, an advanced civilization, not quite type one Kardashev or type two Kardashev, not uh, that type of scale, but just a, a civilization that has expanded beyond their solar system to nearby stars. Well, let's say they visited N stars and colonized N star systems. Well, that's like a factor of N boost over looking for um, primordial life, right? So there's N times as many planets that they could have affected in some way that we could be observationally detectable. Yeah. I think it's a really neat point. It's like this boost factor in detection sensitivity. But then that goes under the assumption, which we don't know the answer to, of course, which is how often when you start with primordial life do you end up with intelligent life? And so that, that approach of looking for evidence of past intelligent civilizations, um, galactic archaeology, whatever you want to call it, uh, only works if the process of going from primordial life to intelligent life is also common. So it's interesting to know that there are a lot of teams out there asking these kinds of questions and seeing what type of observational signatures there might be. Um, and uh, not just in our own solar system, as you talked a, a lot about in, in, in your talk today, Dr. Parks, but also, also beyond. 
All right, so I think at this time, it's a good time to switch over to M and we're gonna share our screens right now and show you our observatory. So M, I'm gonna go ahead and um, uh, give Dr. Parks another round of applause, of course. Um, <laughs> you for <laughs> kindly volunteering to give us a talk on incredibly short notice. Uh, but we are looking at right now a screen with a normal Windows desktop, but it's not any Windows desktop. It's the Windows desktop that's hooked to our computer. And uh, sorry, hooked to our telescope. Uh, you can tell I'm pretty tired today too. Uh, it looks like we've got about one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, six students, six, seven, seven guests on tonight. So again, feel free to ask questions. Well, um, I, just out of curiosity, how many of you have been to our observatory or seen one of our telescope tours before? Raise your hand or uh, virtually with a reaction if you have. Okay, Teresa, you've been here before. All right, thanks. All right, so let's take a look and uh, show you what we're working with. So um, we install these cameras um, webcams basically just uh, before we um, the pandemic started we got really lucky we start with this view over here um, here's a view of our dome we're on top of research hall located um, in um, on our Fairfax campus um, and I'm on the under the assumption that most of you are from the region if you're not feel free to let us know where you're visiting us from today virtually uh, but you can see the dome is very wet right now uh, and uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to open, but we could do all sorts of stuff uh, like spin the dome around and take a look inside. So if we go inside the dome, uh, we have our telescope here. Uh, it's a little hard to get a sense of scale, unfortunately. You can't, there's no human in this picture for perspective. Uh, but the, the diameter of this tube uh, across the, the short direction is around 32 inches, actually a little bit bigger than that, or 0 0.8 meters. So this is what we would call a meter class uh, telescope. And it turns in two different directions. And we're gonna show you how that works in a little bit. And there's a little motor, motor mechanism here, and we'll uh, show you that in a little bit as well. Uh, and here's our control room. Um, I think I'm clicking too fast here. Uh, this is where we normally uh, would be taking you if we were able to do this in person in the before times. Uh, and the computer that we're actually looking at right now is the one just on the left uh, of the screen right over here. And in fact, if I flip back and forth quick enough and create a quick little flash, sometimes you can actually see the flash on the screen. Uh, it doesn't look like that's working today. Uh, we also have a fourth view, of a fourth camera that used to be in a box. Uh, but is now actually pointed at the base of our telescope. It looks a lot like the motor mechanism uh, that we saw uh, in this view over here. Uh, and indeed, in order to point a telescope, we need two different motors, one to turn it in one direction and another to turn it in the other direction. So the one motor mechanism to turn a telescope is here. And then the other motor mechanism is down at the bottom left of this image uh, which we have a, a different view of down here. And um, uh, yeah, again, it's a little bit hard to get a sense of scale, uh, but this is a fairly normal size computer power cable and uh, USB cable uh, to give you an idea of how, how big the sense of scale is. All right, so we have another view to show you is what it's like looking up. Um, and that is our, um, what I fondly call our half sky camera. Uh, which um, is looking upwards. Oh, USB device not found. Okay, so that is not connected properly today. So we're going to have to uh, play with that, uh, and get that fixed next time. Uh, but we do have views of the night sky looking up. And unfortunately, there's nothing to see tonight because it's raining. So um, we'll, we'll, have to come, we'll have to come back uh, and take a look on a clear night. So let's go ahead and launch into our software for controlling the telescope. Uh, and this is actually, um, this piece of software here is a free software called ASCOM. It stands for Astronomy Communication. Uh, and it's a common piece of software for, for talking to um, the telescope. This should have launched the SkyX, which it, maybe it was already launched. But this is a virtual view of our night sky and what we would see. 
Uh, if we're laying down on the ground and looking up, we're kind of really zoomed out right now, but this is the horizon. So we're kind of below the earth from this perspective. And this is kind of like a planetarium show. It kind of gives us a view of the night sky live and we can look around. And if we were in a very dark location, uh, like uh, West Virginia, where there's not a lot of light pollution, uh, this, you know, we could get a glorious view of the night sky, including uh, some of the um, Milky Way. And I could actually kind of just make this a little bit um, clearer. I could turn off some of the clusters, the galaxies, and the nebula, uh, but I'll, I'll leave those on. That doesn't make too much of a difference. You see a big white, uh, sorry, big red uh, screen here, and um, that has to do with a, telling us the orientation of the dome, I think. Uh, but we'll, we'll take a look at that in a little bit. So this shows us where the telescope is currently pointed. And we encourage you to come back on a clear night in two weeks or four weeks, because this time of year is a wonderful time to look at Jupiter and Saturn. And you heard a little bit about some of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn um, earlier uh, today uh, during Dr. Park's talk. And again, if you have any questions about anything we're looking at, please feel free to post them in the chat. So uh, let's look at some stuff and we'll start with moving the telescope. So right now, here's the, the center of the galaxy is actually up right now um, and uh, the constellation of Sagittarius. Uh, and at the moment, that's what we could look at, but unfortunately, uh, we're not gonna be doing that. The moon's also up too. You can see the moon there, uh, us, uh, waning gibbous phase. So I'm gonna go ahead and move the telescope and point it towards the camera, which I believe is roughly located there on the horizon. We're gonna go ahead and switch back to the, the webcam view and take a look um, as the motor starts to turn. Uh, we can see the telescope uh, come towards us. So this is what we call a 32 inch Ritchie Cretion uh, Cassegrain Focus Telescope. Those words are just fancy words for mirrors and the directions the mirrors point and where the light comes to a focus. You know, we, we have eyes and light comes in from a distant location into our eyeballs and focuses on a retina. Telescope works in a very similar way um, and brings the light uh, off of a couple bounces off of a couple of mirrors and brings it to a focus. Those mirrors are curved to bend light coming in towards us. And we can see the opening of the telescope. This is where the light enters. Uh, and you can see at the bottom of the telescope, I pointed it a little bit off. So I'm gonna try and move it in a little bit of the right direction. Uh, and you can see the big mirror uh, located uh, right there. And I just, <laughs> just slewed past it, my apologies. But the mirror, the light comes in from space, bounces off of this big mirror, which has 32 inches of diameter. Um, and that mirror is slightly curved. So that light coming in parallel will then start converging to this structure that we see in front of us blocking part of the opening. That's what we call the secondary mirror. So primary mirror, that's the first surface the light hits. Secondary mirror, that's the secondary surface the light hits. Um, and this mirror actually has a motor that moves the mirror up and down um, and it moves it up and down to focus it much like glasses can be moved and focus light at different locations on the retina of your eye. In this case, the retina of our, of our telescope is on the other side through a hole in the middle of the primary mirror. So the light from this little mirror then bounces down through a hole in the little mirror to the back side. And this is a pretty popular telescope design because it keeps most of the weight of the telescope down at the base of the telescope and it's somewhat easier uh, to engineer. So I'm gonna go ahead and now flip the telescope over. And we'll watch some of the motors turning this time. Oh uh, yeah, let's go to this one real quick. So we can see it's turning the one motor. Oh, you can actually see the tip of the telescope poking through there. There's the telescope just out of going out of view right now at the top of the image. Uh, so we can see this big motor. This is a bunch of computer cables and power cables. 
uh, going through the telescope through a hole in the middle so that they don't um, uh, get twisted and tangled up. You see that motor turning. Let's go back and look at what the telescope's doing. And so now we're starting to see the back side of the telescope come into view. And so this is where the light comes to the focus. And we have here uh, actually a third mirror that allows us to send the light from the telescope to one of four different instruments, including an eyepiece uh, that we use on our in-person nights, as well as a couple of digital cameras. And so the digital camera that uh, we would normally be using tonight uh, is the one located uh, where my cursor is, which I think you can see right now, um, uh, right uh, over here coming into view. And the digital camera that we have is pretty similar to the digital cameras that you find in your cell phones that you take selfies with. There's a great story about the origins of digital cameras. I'll probably spare you the details tonight, but you can thank astronomers and the military for investment in um, digital sensors, which were first um, invented by Bell Labs when they were trying to invent a different kind of computer memory. Turns out it was sensitive to light and astronomers collect light. So they're very interested in this new technology for Bell Labs. Put them on a telescope. They were just a single pixel to start or a few pixels in the case of visible light CCDs or digital cameras. And now they have, you know, this particular camera that we use has 16 million pixels. There are some key differences between the camera uh, we have here that we use for astronomy and uh, the camera you have on your cell phone. In particular, um, we, we want to look at very faint things um, as astronomers. And so we actually choose, uh, we want very big pixels. And so you can't fit a very big sensor in a cell phone. So the, the pixels on your cell phone cameras, even though they may be the same in number, they're a lot smaller in size, actually about one micron in size per pixel. Whereas the cameras, pixels that we use are about nine microns on a side, about 10 times bigger. Uh, second, we make our cameras really cold. Uh, because the, the 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 warm cameras that you have in your cell phone, uh, they can also actually uh, cause light to be recorded even when light's not actually there, just from the heat of the electronics itself. And so we make the the sensors colder, uh, so that we don't have as much contamination from the thermal hum of the electronics themselves inside the camera circuitry. All right, so um, that's a view of our camera uh, and our telescope. You can see uh, the back of the primary mirror. I'll go ahead and um, next, um, just for a little while, um, uh, sync the, the dome to the telescope so we can watch the, the dome turn as well. There, yeah, you can actually see that it was going there. Um, right there, you can see it turning on, on the inside of the dome. We can go outside the dome and, and see it turn over there. Whoops, sorry. That's kind of neat to know that I'm just clicking buttons from my home right now. And uh, uh, we can see the, um, the dome turning and get a sense of the scale of what we're doing from the comforts of our own home. And then I'm gonna go ahead and park the telescope. Watch the dome turn again. I think it might go all the way around. Uh, the dome, by the way, some people, oh, we have some great questions. Okay, what is the aperture of the telescope? It's the 32 inch diameter. Thank you, Paige and Eileen, that's correct. The field of view of the telescope uh, of the eyepiece is a great question as well. Um, so for our digital camera, uh, the field of view of our digital camera is about a little under half. Oh, look, it's spinning pretty fast down the other way. It's about half a degree. So if you know how there's uh, 360 degrees in a circle, we split that up. You take one of those degrees and split it in half. Our, our camera's viewing size is about one third to one half a degree uh, on a side. Very tiny field of view. In fact, we can't even fit the whole moon uh, in our camera's field of view. But for the eyepiece, uh, Dr. Parks, I don't know if we've actually measured the eyepiece field of view for the eyepiece we've been using lately, uh, but I think it's on the order of a degree, one degree. I think so. I think it's about right. So we do look at very narrow um, uh, beams. And, and contrary to a lot of popular astronomy cartoons that you might see, 
Uh, we don't stick the telescope outside the dome. The, the, the telescope does stay inside the dome at all times. Um, it does have that particular shape though, because it spins around um, and it does have an opening. Uh, and we don't fold the whole thing open and expose the whole telescope. But sometimes it gets a little windy um, and the dome can actually help protect um, the telescope from wind shake. Um, and since we're looking at such a zoomed in uh, narrow field of view, just a little bit of wind can uh, distort the image and shake the telescope, uh, among other, other reasons. It's, um, it's interesting to consider the origins of the, of the reasons for the round dome. Okay, so our telescope's parked. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, disconnect from it for now. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, uh, go ahead and park the dome. I'm gonna see it turn one more. I'd like to conclude tonight's session by showing you some of the pictures uh, that we've collected with it. Uh, so we do have uh, some uh, images that we've collected and gosh, that was pretty crazy. Um, so right now we're talking about uh, uh, some of the search for life and, and things like that. And we had a very special event here in December of last year. Uh, it was a conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, just right around the winter solstice. And this is when uh, Jupiter and Saturn were the closest they've been in the sky, if I remember correctly, in about 800 years, something like that. Uh, and they were close enough that we could capture images of both planets within one shot, uh, with one camera shot. And this was actually taken by one of our students, uh, Owen Alfaro, and uh, collected one color at a time and making to a color composite image. And here we can actually see uh, Jupiter and its four main moons. You actually see five dots here. One of these is not a moon. Uh, I don't know if one of them is a bad pixel or just a, a, an interloping star in the background. We kind of got unlucky that the, the fifth object here just lined up with the other four. Uh, but this was a view that Galileo first saw 400 years ago when he pointed the first telescope at the night sky. Uh, and you can see Jupiter's uh, bands, uh, as well as four of the moons, and one of which um, is Europa, which is a possible source of life in our universe. universe. And hopefully, uh, um, hopefully when, when we do go look for life on Europa, it doesn't go like the movie. For any of you who have seen that movie, that, uh, that uh, I would not want to be on that mission. <laughs> I don't know, I probably still would. Um, but yeah, that movie, things did not go well for those intrepid astronomers uh, and, and explorers, astronaut explorers or universe. And here's Saturn, uh, color is a little bit off here, but you can clearly make out its rings um, as taken with our uh, campus observatory. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see, uh, let's see, I don't think we have, I'm not used to doing these tour pictures, so this is something I don't do too often. Uh, going out a little bit further outside of our solar system, um, oh, here's a nice image of our moon uh, taken with our campus telescope, and we got the craters, and it's interesting to think that humans have not been there in 50 years. Uh, well, not quite 50, and close to the 50-year mark, well, 72, 1972 was the last crude uh, landing on the moon. And, and it's interesting to think that we may be coming back there again uh, in the next 10 years. And I'm really excited about that. Uh, thank you, M, for posting a link to our observatory website. Um, but yeah, you can see plenty of detail in craters in the, the mare on the surface of the moon. Go a little bit outside our solar system to some nearby stars. Uh, we have some clusters in our galaxy. Uh, and this is an example of a cluster taken with our campus telescope called M13. And is that the Beehive Cluster? I don't know, that's not the Beehive Cluster. I forget the name of M13. Uh, but this is, I think, a, is this a globular cluster or an open cluster? See, I don't remember these. That is the Great Cluster in Hercules. Oh, is it? Yep. Oh, okay. 13, okay. yep. Yeah, so it's got a number of stars. And wouldn't this be an amazing place to have a planet on and wake up, there'd be so many stars in the night sky that you'd be able to read at night. It's a, quite a dense um, neighborhood of stars compared to our, our part of the galaxy. 
Uh, going a little bit further out um, in the universe, uh, we have other galaxies. And to kind of connect this to SETI, you know that our um, Milky Way galaxy is a, a spiral galaxy. Uh, and here's an example of another nearby spiral galaxy called M31, uh, or not M31, sorry, the Whirlpool galaxy, which I think is M51. Um, I might be misremembering that number. Um, but the Whirlpool galaxy is called the Whirlpool galaxy because it looks like a whirlpool. But we're seeing a face-on view of a spiral galaxy with its downtown uh, center of the galaxy with a couple of very prominent spiral arms winding their way out. And at the end of one of these spiral arms, you see another satellite galaxy. Our own galaxy, the Milky Way, has its own satellite galaxies, the uh, large and small Magellanic clouds, not as large as this galaxy, which is slowly being torn apart by this uh, Whirlpool galaxy over the course of a few billion years. The Whirlpool galaxy is making lunch of it. Uh, uh, but uh, I forget where I was going with that. But uh, it is a beautiful picture of two galaxies interacting with one another. Um, and we can see lots of star formation taking place from these bright regions uh, around these um, <clears throat> spiral arms. And one of the nice things about uh, this galaxy to look at is it tells us a little bit about our own galaxy because we can't look at the entirety of our own Milky Way galaxy. We're inside of it. It's like being a chocolate chip in a chocolate chip pancake and trying to figure out what the rest of the pancake looks like. It's a little bit difficult. Um, and uh, we can see nearby regions of our own galaxy and in certain wavelengths, the galaxy is transparent. We can make some maps of, for example, the hydrogen uh, in our galaxy. Uh, but this, uh, by studying other galaxies, we get nice clear views of um, other spiral galaxies to get some idea of what, what ours is like. And in fact, we knew so little about our own galaxy and the center of it um, that um, the name of this galaxy is the Whirlpool galaxy, uh, Eileen. We know so little about uh, our own Milky Way galaxy that some galaxies have bars in their middle rather than circle round kind of blobs of stars in the middle like this um, Whirlpool galaxy has. Ours is actually slightly elongated. And it, I think we didn't really learn that until like the past 20 years. Um, so just to give you an idea of how challenging it is to study the galaxy within which we reside, which Another fun fact um, is that this galaxy, like our own, contains well over 100 billion stars. Uh, and as Dr. Parks talked about, uh, you know, we now know that, uh, that planets in our universe probably outnumber the stars in our universe. And we now know that, you know, roughly speaking, somewhere between 10 and 50% of those stars can have planets that could support liquid water on their surfaces and be roughly Earth-sized um, if they have sufficient atmospheres, which we don't know if they do, but we suspect they probably do. Uh, and that um, is really um, fascinating to consider. Just in one galaxy alone, there's the possibility of 10 to 40 billion Earth-sized planets capable of supporting liquid surface water like our own Earth. Nanar asked a great question, the name of the camera that we these images with our campus telescope was taken with. It's called, a, the technical name for it is an SBIG, S-B-I-G 16803. I'll go ahead and type that in the chat. Uh, and it's got a sensor in it um, that is a 16 megapixel Kodak uh, CCD, which is short for charge coupled device. And I really like that even Albert Einstein had his hand in, in cameras. When you think about it with the photoelectric effect. So, you know, when you're, it's, it's interesting, when you take a selfie, you're using something that was discovered that was obscure 100 years ago. The idea that light could hit a metal and or an atom and release an electron, something called the photoelectric effect. That's fundamentally the technique that these digital cameras rely on. And it just blows my mind that you can go from obscure physics to uh, a, a massive impact on society 
uh, in, a, in just 100 years. Imagine what type of, of, of obscure physics we're learning about today and, and how it might impact our society 100 years from now, like quantum computing and things of that nature. Uh, and a final note to just bring back the connection to SETI, uh, as we talked about how there could be tens of billions of planets that could support liquid surface water in, in this galaxy alone and in our known visible universe, we know of over um, 100 billion galaxies. Well, that's a huge number of planets on which life could form. And it's a really interesting question to ponder. So someone did ponder this question and uh, Jason Wright at, at Penn State University he said, well, there are a lot of galaxies out there. What if there was a galaxy where intelligent life had arisen and it had spread throughout the galaxy using the von Neumann machines that Dr. Parks talked about? Well, we might see such a galaxy, um, uh, what we would call a Kardashev type three civilization, where they've generated so much waste energy, thanks to things like called entropy in physics, that there would be excess heat coming from those galaxies. And so as it turns out, astronomers launched a mission about, I don't know, two decades ago now called the WISE mission. Maybe a little bit less than two decades, some 15 years ago or so. And it made a map of all the infrared brightnesses of a lot of galaxies in our local universe. And uh, it was called the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer satellite. And there's lots of other astronomy uh, satellites in space beyond Hubble. And he looked, he said, let me look at these galaxies and see if there are any that have too much heat coming from them than would be expected. And you know what? He found some candidates. He actually found 50 candidate galaxies that had a lot of excess infrared radiation coming from them, more than expected out of the few hundred thousand that he looked at. And he said, well, is it aliens? No, not necessarily. Um, you know, it could be, but I'm gonna rule out everything else first. And, uh, and there are other possible explanations. So for example, high rates of star formation uh, can lead to uh, increased amounts of infrared heat or excess heat radiation coming from those galaxies. So I don't know what he's been up to the past couple of years, but of those 50 candidates, but a lot of them could be consistent with natural explanations. But it's still really neat to think about, you know, uh, maybe one of those 50 does host uh, an alien civilization. We don't know, it probably doesn't. But one of the things he did learn was that 50 was the max out of the, I don't know, the 100,000 or so galaxies he looked at. And so that told us right off the bat from a SETI perspective that really advanced civilizations, the type that do conquer their, not conquers, conquer is really a horrible word choice there on my part, uh, do spread throughout um, their entire galaxy, um, that they're rare in our local part of the universe. Uh, that we don't, you know, it could have, it didn't have to be that way. We could have looked and seen every galaxy had infrared heat. And that basically meant that every galaxy had an advanced alien civilization. Turns out that's not the case. So we at least know something new that we didn't know 15 years ago about in our search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We do know that the most advanced types of alien civilizations are, are relatively rare. And so I'd like to thank Dr. Parks again for joining us. And M or uh, Dr. Parks, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, not, uh, nothing other than have a good night. All right, everyone, have a great night. We will see you all in two weeks for our next public night. And take care and stay safe, everyone. Good night. Good night, bye.